turns them on to work for our organisation. The most obvious and most neglected way, I would suggest, is to have an environment of trust in which we can ask them. For the baby boomer, this may be a quantum leap though. Still imbued with the cradle to grave understanding of work, they may be uncomfortable if retirement intentions or transition to retirement questions are asked of them. But that would only be the case if it was in the absence of an environment that there was no trust or one that did not obviously embrace and provide for flexible alternatives. The flexibility exists, but where is the will to use those flexibilities? Retirement intentions is the base from which we can involve with all staff, but particularly those in the baby boomer era or approaching it. Professor Louise Rowland from Swinburne University has identified the critical issues in decision making of retirees, health, work-life balance, social, ongoing lifetime learning and superannuation. Last year, the Premier and Cabinet conducted a, an extensive retirement intention survey in the public sector. It was an excellent survey and an excellent outcome, except for one alarming issue. And that was the widespread lack of retirement planning and work transition planning and financial planning by the, at the individual level. It would seem to me that as an organisation and as an organisation that values our employees, that has to look to the baby boomer for a source of future employee, that we need to provide assistance in this level and in those areas based on trust. We certainly don't want the baby boomer to become extinct by leaving the workforce because they are bored and tired. But worse still would be if the baby boomer stayed in the workforce because they are bored and tired and trapped. We need not limit ourselves to things like part-time work or oldies being mentors. How many mentors can you have in an organisation? If I have 50% of the organisation, as I showed before, that are in that group, how many mentors can you really have in an organisation? But the flexibilities that are available are really only limited by our imagination. What we must do is shake the organisational tree and learn to respect and value all members of the organisation for their contribution. Neither the young nor the old have a mortgage on wisdom. And the ability to contribute rather than longevity and power needs to define one's role in the organisation. We had breaking news just last week that the St George Bank was introducing 12 months parenting leave for grandparents. Yes, the social order of the workforce has changed, is changing, and is capable of change if we are willing to lead it. The baby boomer wants to continue in meaningful work while balancing competing needs at their stage of life. The need to assist the next generation, their children or grandchildren, perhaps caring for their now aged parents and supporting themselves by working and learning in their newfound, longer, healthier life expectancy. The challenge then is to place no limits in thinking outside the box to provide attraction benefits for all our cohorts. But I would suggest particularly for the baby boomer because we are calling them back from the brink. The labour, force, availability demands that we do that. And how do we become an employer of choice to the baby boomer? They are delighted, of course, with their newfound attractiveness to the employer. But the employer 
can see there that based on their availability, their stability and skill sets, which we may previously have not tapped or taken the time to discover, provides us with a very fertile skill set and source of labour into the future. To conclude, I have to say something from my generation and going right back to the 60s. Some of you may not understand it, some of you may not see its relevance. Not only are we back, we are well aware of that classic rock icon of the era, Jim Morrison, who encouraged us to live hard, die young, and leave a good looking corpse. <laughs> Some people are looking rather bewildered, I can see, and whispering to their younger colleagues as to who the hell is Jim Morrison. In the spirit of information technology and sharing, I suggest that you Google it. <laughs> and you will find out and it all become clear. But for those of my era, Jim would be happy in his Parisian resting place to know that while his generation, the baby boomers, didn't take him literally, they live on with a far greater life expectancy than even he could imagine. They are imbued with an ethic to work and play hard. They are convinced that they embrace the wish to die old. And being the children of the 60s, they are forever young, or well, that's what they believe. And so for Jim, they feel that they are extremely well placed to leave good, corp good looking corpses even now. To link our different speakers, what can we learn from other endangered species? So according to the Wildlife Conservation Network, with cheetah conservation, cheetah conservation Botswana was formed to help protect the remaining population of endangered cheetahs in Botswana. One of the last strongholds of cheetahs in the world and with the spirit of collaboration and community participation, the Cheetah Conservation Botswana has created an opportunity to join the effort to protect the cheetahs in all southern uh, locations of Africa, helping to create trans-border management strategies and managing the southern population as a whole. The first step, led by the conservationist Rebecca Klein, is to learn more about the Botswana cheetah and how to protect this very fast, and very rare cat. Could the same be said about learning more about the baby boomers and how to protect this very experienced and endangered human? I'd now like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Deb Whittington. Uh, Deb Whittington will talk from an industry perspective and she's with TAFE uh, WA Central and is the chairperson of the Curriculum Advisory Group for printing and graphic arts. Uh, she is responsible for developing the capability of current and future leaders within an already busy workplace that is uh, limited by workplace resource, uh, resources such as time and people. Deb will draw upon her practical expertise on how to overcome the challenges of the ageing workplace population and in particular strategies on how to harness and capture the corporate intelligence of the existing ageing workplace population and the generation Ys who are, now having to, who are now having a positive impact in driving innovation and technology. Uh, Deb will also share with you her personal views and strategies of how to phase out of a traditional work role by using technology to create passive income. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Deb Whittington. Um, I reflect on all of the things that I've taken from those particular skills, from mental health nursing, it has been an understanding of how people communicate and work together. Um, when I returned to the workforce after having children, I worked as a knife hand in an abattoir, and my low boredom threshold meant that while we were waiting for things to do, I had to go and effectively um, QA the process that I was doing. 
So I had a look at the processes, look what was not effective, what was most effective, and put things into place so that people could finish earlier and um, people could do things more efficiently and more effectively. I found that that really didn't intrigue me very much. So when we moved up to the city again from the country, um, I began to study computing and programming. And uh, I had a look at this and emerge, emerging technologies, which I'll talk about um, shortly. I'm the sum of my experiences, and every single one of you is the sum of yours. My experiences are not only what I have learnt in my work roles, what I have learnt in my formal education, but every other interaction I've had with a human being, every interest I've pursued, every passion I've had, have informed who I am now. I wanted to be a doctor of words when I grew up. I wanted to make a difference, and I wanted to have the wisdom of Solomon. I'm still quite a long way from the last one, and certainly haven't achieved the first, but working in the printing industry is partly on the way there. The definition of retire, leave office of employment, especially because of age, to withdraw, to go away, to retreat. Um, I come from a very, very strange family. Uh, when I was a child, I saw an old person as being a 60-year-old lady with a blue rinse and a very, very tight perm. And when people turned 60, it was a straight decline from there. They became very unwell, uh, particularly if they've left the work workforce, and tended to uh, pass away 68, 70 years old. As was expressed earlier, our life expectancy has substantially changed over the years. Now, they say that the 40 is the new 25. The 50 is the new 30. What's your passion? Do you really intend to withdraw from society? I don't. Part of my observation of people choosing to retire is it's a very, very quick process from retirement to becoming oversated with just spending money and doing the good things in life, to losing passion and gradually going downhill in health, unless people actually pick up something else and move on into another career, uh, into mentoring, uh, into volunteer work, somewhere where they can make a difference, somewhere where they can apply their passions, somewhere that they can um, innovate somewhere where they can make a difference. <coughs> these are some of my favourite people. Um, what do these artists, innovators and entrepreneurs have in common? I had this, this cadre of students, five or six of them. They were quite amazing. They weren't achieving uh, the results in the tests and the assessments that uh, I was given to give to them. The people who were achieving the, uh, the high marks in those assessments tended to be people who had no understanding of the technology, but knew things by rote. Um, these guys had an intimate understanding of the technology. They knew what it could do. It was instinctive in them. In the majority, they spoke a second language. They had an interest in uh, music, whether they were members of a band or uh, had substantial music collections. They preferred serious conversations to large parties of people. Um, many of them spoke a second language, and the majority of them read science fiction and fantasy. These were the people who would actually go out into industry and make a difference. Probably the border between Gen X and Gen Y. Um, this made me think, the observation of the two different types of people, firstly that we had to move away from the old traditional assessment processes, which we have with our uh, competency-based assessment. I asked my students what is most important, the piece of paper at the end of this course or the knowledge that you have to acquire this piece of paper? And without exception, my adult students, who um, comprise probably 50% of my classes, say the knowledge. 
The younger students say the piece of paper. They don't have the life experience and the work experience to be able to um, use existing knowledge and skills. Those entrepreneurs, they have talent. But every single person on this planet has talent for one thing or another. If we actually employ those talents, we find that we're uh, working hard is not working hard. What I can say, though, is something that my grandfather, who was quite a philosopher, used to say to me frequently. This above all, quote from Shakespeare, to thine own self be true, then it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, do you? So, what can we learn from other endangered uh, species? The painted dog conservation. The African wild dog, or painted hunting dog, was once common in Africa with numbers of over 500,000 in 39 countries. The effects of human encroachment have drastically reduced the range in numbers. Currently, an estimated 3,000 dogs remain and are restrict restricted to four southern African countries. Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Botswana and South Africa. With time running out, the Painted Dog Conservation Project is developing innovative solutions to protect this unique wild canine. Based in Huang National Park in western Zimbabwe, the Painted Dog Conservation works with local communities to create and execute new strategies for conserving the wild dog and the habitat it shares with people and other predators. Could the same be said about developing innovative solutions to protect the unique baby boom mavericks who have to share their habitats with people and other workplace predators? Now, I'd just like to introduce uh, Ben Gagan. Ben is with uh, HR Wise, and he's going to talk from a day-to-day -day perspective about the ageing workplace uh, population. Ben is the Director of Employment uh, Solutions. Ben has been involved ex ex extensively in workplace human resource issues that surround industrial relations. Recruitment selection and retirement strategies in this role um, has been one of his primary responsibilities. As a human resource specialist,